Welcome to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? I'm Erin Summers. I'm a sports broadcaster that's covered the Atlantic Coast Conference for a very long time, and I grew up a fan. I've always been curious what players do after we obsess over them in college. This podcast answers that question. Each week, you'll hear an interview with a former ACC athlete. We'll find out everything they've been doing since playing in college. Thanks for listening. Let's jump in to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? This week, I'm joined by former Clemson guard, Shawan Robinson. Robinson averaged a team leading 12.3 points per game and had a free throw percentage of 91.3. That was good for third in the nation. Robinson became the first Clemson Tiger to be named academic all ACC in each of his four seasons. Since playing in college, Robinson headed overseas and has since pursued his coaching career. Here's our conversation. Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Of course. Where are you calling in from? I am calling in from Cary, North Carolina. I coach uh, and teach at Panther Creek High School. As you can see, my uh, classroom's virtual background is behind me. Um, So this is where I sit and teach, you know, teach every day. When you think back to your beginnings in basketball and what drew you into that, um, where did it start? I was just always around it. Um, When I was little, my dad was still playing pickup and in leagues around here. Um, my love for the ACC was real deep. He played at Appalachian State for Bobby Crimmins, who was eventually at Georgia Tech. And we would go down there twice a summer to uh, attend basketball camp. And just and I have a cousin that played at UVA. So it was just kind of the ACC was ingrained in me. Um, my love for the game wasn't forced. It was something that, you know, I naturally came to love. And, you know, to this day, I, I still do. I watch a lot of games on TV. I'm still playing pickup and in leagues like my dad was. So. You know, it's one of the most flattering things is to be called Coach Rob, and that that was, you know, what he was called as I was growing up. He was your coach at Leesville High School. What was it like playing for him in high school, you know, having your dad be your your coach as well? Um, We are best friends now uh, because of it, but at the time we were not best friends because of it. (laughs) Uh, You know, being at school all day with him and practice, and, you know, he was always harder on me than – than everyone else. I mean, than he was on anyone else, just because he wanted them to know that I didn't get anything easy. Um, but because of it, to this day, we're best friends. You know, we talk on the phone once or twice a day. Um, so now it was, you know, looking back on it, it's something I wouldn't trade for the world. When you were trying to make the decision about where you were going to go play, and you mentioned your love for the ACC, was it always going to be an ACC school, just kind of depended where? Um, I think the ACC had the nod over everyone else. Um, I think it, it, it came down to like Stanford and, and Clemson and, and Florida State. Um, I just think that, you know, it had to do with opportunity to play and opportunity for my parents to see me play. You know, Stanford was hard to turn down at the time. They were, um, they were really good, top 10 in the country, um, but it was just so far. Um, and, you know, you know, you wait your whole life for your parents to be able to see you on that stage. And I just didn't want to, didn't want to go that far away from home. I assume that your parents made a lot of trips there to watch you at Clemson where you decided to go play. How much fun was it to be able to have them there and watch you play in your collegiate games? Oh, it's, I mean, it's something you can replace. Um, you know, they would be able to take weekend trips. Uh, they would be able to see the games, the away games. Cause a lot of some of the away, most of the away games were closer to home than, you know, home games. So, you know, it was just something that they enjoyed. They burnt, they were up and down 85 all the time watching games. And, you know, it was, it was, it was always comforting to have those, those faces in the stands. When you were at school, what were some of your most memorable moments, uh, games that stand out to you? Um, my sophomore year would beat Carolina at home on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a pretty good game. That was a remember, a uh, very memorable one. Uh, another one was when we became postseason eligible, um, my junior year, um, I got a steal, and Sherrod Ford got a dunk at the buzzer uh, to win to win that game, and you know beating South Carolina, you know, which was our you know out of conference rival, was was always you know always good memories. How did I know you were going to bring up the Carolina one? I mean, that's where I went to school, and yeah. that's one that I'm always going to remember as well, but not for good yeah. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we got them. My, we got them my first two years at home. Obviously, we didn't get them until you know, 2020 at UNC. So at least I don't yeah. have to hear that anymore. But, uh, you know, this is always, that was always a game that I look forward to. Definitely. I mean, you can say that you beat Carolina, which is 
not what a lot of other tigers can say. Yeah. When you were there, you had such good touch. Um, you set a record at, at Clemson for your free throw percentage at 91.3. How mm-hmm. much did you practice your free throws? Um, I think, I mean, I practiced them because we practiced them in practice, but I think for me, they were just free points. Um, and you looked at it as it's just me in the, in the rim and I wanted those points. So and I think a lot of it is confidence and repetition. And I was just confident that I went up there that I was going to make them. So um, it is something that I try to teach my kids here about free throw, you know, step to the line, know that you're going to make them, you know, have your routine. But for me, it was just, you know, repetition and confidence. Your senior season, uh, you averaged 12 and a half points had a really good year to finish things out. You guys ended up going to the NIT a couple of times when you were there. What were those postseason tournaments like? Um, wish they would last a little bit longer, but it was it was great to have that opportunity to, you know, play past, you know, past the ACC tournament. My first year, I believe we would have made the NIT tournament, but um, we had a coaching change mm-hmm. and the school decided against it. So to finally get to those in my junior and senior year, it was, it was really rewarding. Um, would have loved to play in the NCAA tournament. I believe we were kind of close maybe my senior year, but, you know, the opportunity to play in the postseason was definitely something that I'll, I'll remember. With that coaching change um, right after your freshman year, obviously, you know, going to Purnell, um, not who recruited you, how did you kind of handle that transition? Um, it was tough. It was tough being there and, and kind of knowing that, you know, he was weeding people out. Um, but eventually I think he realized that I need, he needed me and I needed him for his, you know, transition and for me to finish, have a good college career. So, you know, we had that mutual respect. I really, really loved coach Bradley on the staff. He made the transition for us, for me, a lot easier. Um, and I think that, you know, even though I didn't reap the benefits of the NCAA tournaments, I think that I would, me and one of my teammates, Ken Akimbala were, you know, key in getting him on that that track to where they were, you know, they made two or three straight um, NCAA tournaments. Yeah, absolutely. When you were done at Clemson, what were some of the decisions that you had to make regarding maybe continuing your basketball career or taking another path? Um, so I made my decision kind of like early. So going into my senior year, I had to student teach and I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to student teach after um my eligibility was exhausted because I wanted to be able to go overseas right away and not have to worry about it. So my second semester, my senior year, I was in the classroom 40 hours a week in addition to, uh, in addition to playing. Looking back on it, was it the best decision for my, you know, my performance at the time? Maybe, maybe not, but um, it allowed me to go overseas and play for a few years. And then once, you know, getting a job was, you know, I was waiting to come, you know, because in Europe, you have to wait in the summer. And once I got tired of waiting, I would, uh, I just activated my teaching license and kind of got right into coaching. You mentioned how big of a load you took on your senior year with your classes and student teaching. However, you were all academic every single year at Clemson, the first player ever to do that for the program. How were you able to balance all of that and, you know, succeed at such a high level academically? I just got to give credit to my mom. You know, my mom and my dad, they were both educators. And, you know, I understood that, you know, school was important and that that was a priority. So, you know, I just made sure that I did what I needed to do, you know, in the classroom so that, you know, I could do what I wanted to do as far as playing basketball when I was younger. You know, I had to make sure I did what I needed to do so I could do what I wanted to do. And that's just that's just my mom, you know, so I can't take all the credit for that. Well, good for her. After you were done at Clemson, you mentioned you decided to go overseas. Um, mm-hmm. Culture shock was the playing level, you know, very different. How did you adjust? Um, I think the biggest concept misconception is is that you're playing professionally. Uh, you know, the ACC programs that 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 I was a part of are more professionally run than a lot of the professional teams overseas. Um, now you are getting paid overseas, which makes it you know, it makes it a little bit easier to deal with some of that stuff. Um, but as far as culture shock goes, I was in Newcastle, England, my first my first trip. Um, thankful they spoke English. It was mm-hmm. hard learning how to drive on the other side of the road. Um, but I had a teammate in, uh, who played with me at Clemson, Alou Babalola, who um, kind of helped me with that transition. And then I was in Germany for the next year and a half, and then I finished out in the Czech Republic. 
Um, it is a lot different. Each place was a lot different. Each place had its pros and its cons. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when, when it became waiting too long, you know, to find a job, I was happy to, you know, to go ahead and get insurance at home and, and get a job and, and go ahead and get my coaching and teaching career started. You mentioned that over the summers you waited. So does that mean that you stayed overseas the entire time when you were there? You kind of, during the off season, you were working and just kind of waiting for basketball to start again? No, I would come home. So um, the season in Europe is like August to May, May or June, depending on how long your team um, is in it. And then what I would do is I would come home. I would spend time with family. I would work out. I would continue to get better. And then you're just kind of waiting on phone calls from like your agent or, you know, whoever represents you to let you know that you have a job. Um, and for some guys, they would, you know, wait. some guys like even right now, the season started over there. You got some guys that are still waiting to go over. How nerve wracking is that? It is very nerve wracking. If you don't, if you're not making, you know, if you're not in that top tier guys that's making, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, you're ready, you're ready to get your next check. Yeah, so, definitely. It is definitely nerve wracking, not knowing where you're going to be, not knowing what language is going to be spoken, where you're going to be. But, you know, it's kind of it comes with the territory. I'm glad I did it. I wouldn't regret it for the world. Some of the experiences that you had to have, I'm sure were amazing going to some different countries and stuff. What were some of your favorite places that you were able to visit? Mm, I really liked, I think that my favorite place to visit, and I didn't play there, but we were there for a couple nights, was uh, Budapest in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Um, it was really just a beautiful city. Um, from what I saw, the cultural was, was, was awesome. Um, I really liked living in Germany. Um, it was just like being here. There were a lot of army bases and, you know, a lot of people that spoke English. Um, so those were probably two of my favorite places that, you know, that I got to spend time in. And maybe a favorite moment is the British playoff championship that you won. Yeah, uh, that, that was fun. Uh, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was fun. I guess my favorite moment overseas would probably be um, when we, so, you know, over there they get, uh, they move up and move down based on their performance. And I think there was a team that I was playing for the geese and 46ers and they had been in the first league for a very long time. And we kind of had a, we were kind of struggling and uh, I played really well in the game that clinched that we would stay up in the first division because the city kind of, the city went nuts that night. So that was one of my most memorable, memorable moments. Okay. that would be pretty fun. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so when you decided, it probably been about four years that you played overseas? Yeah. Yeah. And then you decided after a little while, like, what made you decide that you kind of were done doing that and you wanted to pursue your um, teaching? Um, so my wife now, she wasn't my wife at the time, but we were, you know, we were really serious. Um, she had prayed with my daughter, Cassidy, and I just didn't want to be you know, bouncing back and forth without them or, you know, without being able to see my daughter for most of the year. So that was kind of the, you know, if I could, if I could have went somewhere where I was making, you know, a lot of money where they can come and, and not have to worry, but I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to be bouncing back and forth. So my daughter, Cassidy, she's 10 now. Uh, she, I have two daughters, her, her Cassidy and Callie, Callie who's four. And they just, I mean, there's so much fun to be around and I couldn't imagine, you know, traveling back and forth and not being able to see them. Do either of them, I guess, has probably a little bit too young, but Cassidy, does she play basketball at all? Uh, she comes to my camp, but that's all she wants to do. She's a softball player. She likes softball. She's a lefty, so she likes to pitch, and, and she can hit it pretty good, too. So Okay. I'm, I, that's what I, I, I play softball. I'm a lefty as well, so yeah. I can respect that for sure. Yeah. And your first uh, head coaching job was there at Panther Creek. You're an assistant coach there prior how excited mm -hmm. were you to to finally get that head coach head coaching opportunity? Uh, I mean, there's it's nothing like it. Uh, nothing like calling your first time out. So coming out of college, Coach Brunell offered me a grad assistant job, um, but I wanted to play. And then, you know, had a couple of assistant opportunity jobs as far as like D2 colleges or whatever. But I, for me, I just wanted to call my own timeouts to see what that's like to call my own timeouts first. And so, give you know, getting the opportunity from L.J. Hep, who is a actually played JV at Carolina, um, he's a coach now at Holly Springs. For him being the AD to give me my opportunity here, you know, I was I was very pleased, and I've been very blessed to have some really good players here um, since I since I've been coaching. What has been you know your favorite part of, of being a high school coach? 
uh, just the relationships I get to build with, with my the players, um, being able to be somebody that they can lean on as far as, you know, advice or, you know, need a ride somewhere, just the relationships that I've been able to build um, and being able to see them, you know, it pay off for them to be successful. I currently have a guy that uh, that's at UVA. Um, his name is Justin McCoy. He had one of his best games against Carolina last year at UVA. Um, and then, I, I mean, I've had a couple other guys that are playing college, a couple other guys. I got one guy who's um, who played for me, probably one of my favorites. He's a, a journalist. He's a news reporter for um, in Rock Hill. So just being able to see those guys be successful is probably the most rewarding, rewarding piece. Definitely. You mentioned earlier that you also have a basketball camp. Um, mm -hmm. You started that about six years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I think this year would have been your seventh year. However, I'm not quite sure how that went down with COVID. Um, yeah. But what went into you wanting to start that and kind of just tell me a little bit about what it is. Okay, so uh, Shawan Robinson Basketball School, this would have been our seventh year. Obviously, it was canceled due to COVID, understandably. Um, but for me, it was it's just about building a sense of pride and putting on a Panther Creek uniform. Um, we have kids that st uh, start at five years old. I mean, I've had kids that have come every year since I've had it. Um, and then what, by the time they get to high school, there's just a sense of pride in being able to, you know, be around me and my family. My whole family works it. And, you know, putting on the Panther Creek uniform, that's that for them, you know, it's something that that they look forward to, um, you know, at, you know, as a kid. So just being able to instill that pride, sense of community. I mean, it's been really awesome to see how it's grown over the past seven years. I read that you've had a lot of former players that have come in and been guest speakers or come and participated. Do you have any big names people we would recognize? Um, yeah. So, you know, in the area, obviously, you know, that it's a pretty fertile basketball area at my camp. So that I've had over the past, I've had, um, Darius Johnson Odom who played at Marquette played a little bit in the NBA. Julian Gamble played at, uh, Miami. Um, I've had James Mays come. I've had a few Wolfpackers come, uh, Terry Henderson, um, and a couple of those guys. So, you know, I just try to keep it. I try, what I try to do is find some current guys that the kids will recognize mm -hmm. and come and speak for an hour and they get to see and, you know, kind of touch, you know, you know, guys they see on TV, they're able to see and touch and, and know that they're real and, and able to talk and get advice and stuff like that. So it's, it, like I said, it's where it started and where it's, where it's come is, is pretty rewarding. You mentioned that your dad, your family participates in it as well. At this point uh, you're the head coach, right? Your dad's not coaching anymore. So you get to call all the shots. Yes, he's my assistant. Every now and then, I gotta tell him to uh, shut up and sit down. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, nah, he's he's a he's a calming influence on the bench. He obviously has really good eyes and is able to tell me, you know, give me advice. He, I do have the freedom to say yes or no. But like I said, he's my best friend. So you know, having him on the bench is is is, is real comforting. Do he still come to all your games? Uh, he's an assistant. Okay. Yes. So yeah, so he actually he, does he work comes, with you. Yeah, he actually is at every game. He doesn't do practice anymore. He told me he doesn't do practice, but he comes to all the games. Your mother and your sister also and have been involved in education. Is that something mm -hmm. that your family just has valued from the very beginning? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's just the way of life. Um, I'm in love with my, my, my lifestyle. Um, being able to have the relationship with my players, being able, but it's not so time consuming that I can have, you know, relationship with my, you know, my family. It's just, the lifestyle is awesome. You know, you, you're getting weekends, you know, you're getting the holidays um, and, you know, you have everything you need and, and most of the things you want. So it was just something that, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what else I would do to be very honest with you. You've been at Panther Creek since 2014 as the head coach mm -hmm. and Bit, so you've been there for quick math, which I'm not good at, six years or so, and at, including your assistant coaching time there as well. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think the next step is for you after coaching there? I don't, I don't know. I haven't really thought that far ahead. I do kind of flirt with the idea of coaching in college, um, but, you know, for me, you know, like I said, I love my lifestyle. I love being able to, you know, put my all into it, but I'm not thinking about 2025 right now like some college coaches are. You know, they're looking to see what's going to happen three or four years down the line. 
um, the instability of it as far as moving. You know, you win, you move, you lose, you move. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that um, the culture that we have built here at Panther Creek, just as an athletic department and as a school, um, I couldn't see myself leaving unless, you know, it's, you know, a buddy of mine or somebody that I really trust gets a college job. And other than that, I, you know, if I could be here for the next 25 years, I'm cool with that. Panther Creek has definitely become one of the really big powerhouse schools, especially in the Cary area, as far as athletics go. What have mm -hmm. been some of the highlights um, that you've been able to achieve there as the head coach? Um, in the past, in the past two years, I think we have the second most wins in the county. Um, we've been able to go back to back in conference tournaments, um, but I, I really do take pride. Like, I'm more proud of the fact that I got, you know, young men that are, you know, boys that are becoming very productive young men. Um, you know, they're able to fulfill their dreams, whether it be, you know, in journalism or basketball or, you know, going to school. So. I mean, that's the things that I'm most proud of. But my most memorable moment since I've been here at Panther Creek has got to be the first uh, conference championship. We beat our, our rival, which is like a mile or two away in Green Hope, um, to clinch the conference title. This year has to have been different. Obviously, athletics have been pushed back. You are practicing now. But how have you adjusted to you know, the different restrictions and the schedule? Um, I think the, the, the message I send to my players and my kids is just, you know, do your best to remain positive. Um, we don't have a whole lot of control of what's going on. Um, and just be ready because at some point they're going to say go and we have to, we don't, we don't have time to, you know, feel sorry for ourselves or to get ready. We have to stay ready. So just, just, you know, stay positive. Um, you know, be able to adapt to whatever, you know, with the mask mandate coming down. I know some of my guys, you know, rolled their eyes and like, man, you just got to do what they tell us to do so that when it's time to go, we can go. I have noticed that a lot of my players, you know, just mentally and myself are just struggling with all the uncertainty and, you know, things not being normal. But, you know, I understand that I have to be a positive light and, you know, you want them to you know, maintain a certain positive, you know, positivity. So just remain positive, roll with the punches, and, and whenever they say go, it's time to go. Being here in the Triangle area, how much do you push Clemson, especially when it comes down to Clemson, NC State, Duke, Carolina games? Um, I'm always I'm always cheering for my Tigers, but I don't I don't force it on anybody. I get a, I got a lot of calls last weekend when uh when we lost to Notre Dame. Um, I get ragged about the the record at UNC, but you know. I'm a, I'm a tiger through and through, and you know I don't force it on anybody. Um, whenever there's a we have a player that I think that is can play at that that um, level, um, I will give Clemson the first phone call. I will give them the first phone call. I haven't had one go there yet, but um, I do give them the courtesy of giving them the first phone call. And you know if it happens, I hope it happens one day that I get a guy to go there. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. When you were playing, who were some of the, the players that stood out to you, either that you know you played with or you played against as just you know really good athletes? Um, so I was at, at Leesville, I played with a McDonald's All-American that went to Florida State. His name is Anthony Richardson. Um, that's probably one of my most rewarding years ever, my junior year in high school. Um, but I played with and against Shavlet Randolph, who was at Duke. Um, I played with and against Eric Williams, who went to Wake Forest. Um, played with Carmelo Anthony. I mean, the area the area that I came up with it was some really good, some really good basketball. I got a chance to be on LeBron's uh, team at ABCD camp. So I mean, I got to play with and against a lot of Hall of Famers, Chris Paul, um, and it, you know, it was able being able to say that I played with and gave those guys fits mm -hmm. um, is is awesome. And you know, a lot of my kids, you know, I show them pictures and stuff. They you know they they kind of are shocked sometimes. Yeah, you ever pull out any tape and show them when you played? Uh, a little bit. No, I don't. I try not to be too self-promoting, but you know, every now <laughs> and then, because I can't do what I used to, I, I have to pull it out. So they, they know. Yeah, when you're talking to your your players and drawing off some of your experiences, and you know, especially how well you did in school, what are some of the the main things that you like to instill in them while you have them there on your team? Um, I think the biggest thing I try to instill in them is to kind of keep their circles small, especially when they get to a point where they're pretty good, you know, and everybody kind of wants to have advice for them. Um, you know, I just try to get them to look through, you know, 
look through their own eyes and see, you know, who can help you, um, who's in it for, you know, themselves, and just let them know that their hard work pays off, you know. I think a lot of people get caught up in the the YouTube highlights and the mixtapes, and, you know, I just want them to understand that, you know, if you play the right way and you're good enough, you know, you you know, you can play somewhere. We, we can find somewhere for you to play. Um, but the biggest thing is, you know, hard work pays off. Um, and if you, if you work hard, the results, the results come. How much have you seen the game change and how have you had to adjust your coaching style, um, you know, to what's popular right now in basketball? Um, you just have, you just have to, you just have to adapt. I think the biggest thing right now are like the trainers and the, quote unquote exposure. I mean, and you kind of have to, I mean, you have to have a relationship with those guys. And I'm fortunate enough to have some relationships with some really good guys, but um, you, the AAU piece, the travel club, you know, you just have to have, I've learned that I have to have good relationships with the people that my kids are surrounded with. And then I do my best to make sure that my kids hear the truth from whoever they're working out with. Um, but that's probably the biggest thing is the trainers, the trainers and, you know, kids sometimes would rather train with their trainer than train with their team. And you have to, you know, that's just, you know, it's a long explanation, but you, you have to let them know, you know, where their priorities should lay. For this season, what should we expect from Panther Creek and who should we be looking out for? Um, so I recent, I think we'd be really good. If we get to play, we'll get it. We'll have a chance to be really, really good. Um, I have a guy that's currently uh, actually he signed yesterday with, um, Yesterday, two days ago, he signed two days ago with uh, UNC Charlotte. I think they just like to be called Charlotte now. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Dalen Berry. And then I have um, another senior that's really good. I think he has a chance to play Division Two. His name is Dylan Drinkwater. All, he's an all-name team for sure. His last yeah, name. definitely. <laughs> and then um, I got a couple sophomores that have a chance to be pretty good. So I really think that if, if we're able to play, which, you know, fingers crossed, I'm trying to do all that we can to make sure that we do, we have a chance to be very good again and make a deep state run. Yeah, advice for any kid out there that, that wants to play at the next level? Um, any advice? Just, just keep your head down, uh, work hard. Make sure you work on things that are going to help you. You know, you see so many of these, these, these trainers and these tapes of guys doing stuff that you're just not going to be allowed to do in a game. Or, you know, everybody's not going to be allowed to do in the game. So just make sure you work on stuff that's relatable to the game work hard, keep your circle small, and, you know, you know, lean on your parents for advice. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's good to see that you're still in the area doing well, and I'll look out for that Panther Creek team once you guys start playing. All right. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you don't ever miss an episode of ACC Stars, Where Are They Now?